Welcome to Evolve Law at Denton's here in Palo Alto. And thank you to our two sponsors, Denton's and Next Law Labs and Thomson Reuters. So my name is Mary Jutton, and I'm one of the co-founders of Evolve Law. And we're not going to spend very much time on what Evolve Law is, because I see most of the people in the audience are people that know Evolve Law. But we are a catalyst for legal innovation, and we're very excited. This is about our 50th event, I think, in the last uh, ever since we started, and one of our uh, founding members, Davis Wright Tremaine, is here, and Denton's joined us. Those are our two law firms, and then we have over 140 other innovative members, including Thomson Reuters. So it's been very exciting. Here's some upcoming events. Um, Toronto and New York City, the Tech Savvy In-House Council, and then you'll notice we're doing a lot of things with other um, other entities, so we're doing the Tech Savvy panel at an ARC conference, and then we're doing our infamous Darwin Talks, which we'll have one in a minute. We're doing them at the Legal, Legal Week West Coast, because we need more acronyms, and um, Legal Shield is doing a conference for their attorneys, and it's called Elevate, and it's in San Diego in July, so that is it for me. Um, so we are going to start off with a Darwin talk, and David Curl is going to come up, and I'm just going to do this, play from the start. I will hand you that. And so David um, supports Thomson Reuters' legal business with research, thought leadership. He's an awesome writer, and uh, he works on the... How come it doesn't say... Le LEI. Yes, that's not in your bio. Um, so he's um, part of the Legal Executive Institute, and he came to Thomson Reuters in 2013 from Outso. And uh, so he's going to talk to us about a very interesting report. So I'm going to. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was, she just said what I was just going to say about myself, so I don't need to go into that, um, other than to say that as a part of uh, Legal Executive Institute, uh, we do a fair amount of uh, research about the legal industry to help our, our customers, Thompson Reuters legal customers, both law firms and in-house lawyers, understand where the market is moving, where the industry is moving. One aspect of it that we keep hearing about, um, we all do, is that the uh, legal industry is flat, and we see data from our own um, peer monitor uh, that um, indicates that over the last 10 years, uh, law firm growth has bounced around up and down either side of 0% for, for quite a while now. And, um, at, and yet, there's a sense that there's a lot of legal work still going on. There's a lot of legal spend going on from in-house uh, uh, in-house departments. So where's all that money going? Where's that business going? And uh, a lot of people are pointing to the existence of a growing sector of non-law firm legal services providers, which we are calling alternative legal services providers. So these are non-law firms that are engaged in delivering some form of legal services uh, in the industry. And we realize there's, there's really no good, uh, uh, nobody has a good hum on what that um, looks like, how big it is, who's using them, and why. So that, that's why we launched this study. And the conclusion we came to is that, uh, and if I can get this, there we go, it's happening. Uh, I, I, I root for the Minnesota Twins, which is a notoriously bad baseball team, and every time they win two games in a row, all my Twitter friends say, put this hashtag up and say, it's happening now. And, and they've just won the first two games of the year, so they're on track for 162 wins. So, so it's happening. But it's also happening with alternative legal services providers. Uh, this is what we found. 51% um, of law firms uh, are using the types of providers that, that, uh, that we covered in this study. 60% of corporate in-house uh, law departments are using alternative providers. That's a pretty significant chunk of the market. Um, we surveyed uh, law firms of various sizes, uh, several hundred, um, and then we also did a number of uh, uh, in-depth uh, interviews with uh, both law firm leaders and with in-house counsel. Uh, and uh, this was a, a, a pretty significant um, uh, penetration, we thought. We also <clears throat> looked towards the future and asked them, uh, what are your plans in the future? And an, an additional 21% of law firms and an additional 14% of corporations are planning to, um, to use alternative providers in the future. 
The main conclusions of the study are, are, are three. Uh, one is that the, um, the use of alternative legal services providers is all about uh, specialized exp expertise rather than low cost, or, or more precisely, in addition to low cost. Uh, and I think there's been, you know, ever since large scale legal process outsourcing came onto the market, uh, there's a sense that it's all about labor arbitrage, it's all about lowering costs, cheaper labor uh, to, to perform routine legal tasks. But what our study shows is that there's actually uh, more and more buyers are turning to alternative legal service providers to uh, gain access to some specialized expertise that they don't have in-house. It's not about cost. It's about getting access to that expertise. Oops. And then the second um, finding, major finding, is that law firms are increasingly seeing this whole space as an opportunity for them to broaden the services they uh, deliver to uh, to respond more quickly to client demands and that sort of thing, and almost to build a sort of general contractor model where they're still maintaining the relationship with the client, but that they're farming out uh, portions of the of the work in a more strategic way uh, than before. And then, whoops! Finally, the third uh, main finding was that, um, it, particularly in the interviews, this came out that. Uh, Many of our respondents are anticipating that that in the future, what's really going to drive this market forward is a combination of technology with services. So specialized uh, firms that understand a particular process, understand the technology that needs to be applied to that process, and can combine those two uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a package. Uh, the, one of the other main questions we wanted to get at was what are the ALSPs being used for? It's not too surprising on the law firm side. They're still predominantly, or not predominantly, but the, one of the largest uh, uses are for litigation-related services. So e-discovery, document review, that sort of thing. Uh, other forms of litigation support. Um, on the corporate side, it's more varied. It's a wider range of services that the, the corporate in-house uh, departments are, are buying, including regulatory risk and compliance, other kinds of specialized uh, legal advice, legal research, and IP management, and such things. So that's a bit of a difference that, that differentiates the approach of, the, of law firms and corporations. Uh, the other thing you, um, you see when, you, when, we, when we ranked them, this is, this is the the sort of the, the, the surprising part a bit is that for both law firms and corporations, the, the part about controlling costs was really not the not the leading um, uh, not the leading reason to going to a, to an ALSP. Uh, that access to specialized expertise, when you get under it and you look at some of the interviews we did, is is not necessarily legal expertise. It may be just expertise in understanding how to put together and run a process. It may be understanding that there are certain types of professionals other than lawyers that are uh, able to execute uh, a certain type of, of, of matter um, more efficiently. So that's, a, that's a, key, uh, a key finding there. The other thing that's important, you see a few um, traces of it here, is that client mandates are important. Uh, more and more the in-house um, provider, uh, in-house departments are uh, uh, requiring uh, the use of, uh, of third-party uh, providers as well from their law firms. So there's a lot of varying reasons um, for, for, for using them, but it's no longer just about cost and price. We also took a look at the size of the market. Um, if you add this all up, it's $8.4 billion. Uh, the, ca the category in the middle is sort of what you think of as the LPO space. Uh, document review service providers, that sort of thing. It's the biggest share at at, at sixty two. Uh, sorry, six point two million. Um, sorry, yeah, six point two. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> what am I? Doing? <laughs> I know, I but I got to take it. <laughs> uh, managed legal, managed legal services. If you think of that as sort of uh, LPO, but uh, but more on a on an ongoing basis rather than on a project basis, where uh, certain providers are are starting to take over an entire. Uh, function from uh, from a from a client, for example. That's we think probably one of the faster growing uh, segments of this. The other segments are contract lawyers, 
uh, captive LPOs or, or other sort of law firm affiliates where their firms are setting up a separate entity to, to work on certain kinds of matters. And then the big four are definitely uh, making a splash in this space, not so much in the US because of the regulatory environment, but elsewhere around the world for sure, um, more and more legal work is being done by the big four. So that's our, uh, that's our conclusion, it's happening. Um, here's the URL if you wanna download the report uh, and uh, take a look yourself, and I'd be happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, we'll just leave that. We'll just leave that URL up there. Um, so we're going to start the panel now. So I'm going to introduce the moderator and then jump back on the panel. So this is um, yes, um, Maya Markovich from Next Law Labs and Dentons. And so oops, don't want to trip. She's a former civil litigator, and she is a subject matter expert at the intersection between law and technology. And she leads the, and I have to read this, definition, development, and launch of new products for Next Law Labs. And she does um, product management and marketing for the 12, now 12, um, in the portfolio. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> I guess we don't have to ask you to introduce yourself again, right? No. I don't. I feel like we I feel like we don't really need the mic either, but um, we need the mic for. for we need the mic oh, we do. Okay, audio. all right, that's cool. Um, since I got introduced, why don't you guys just briefly introduce yourselves? So we know your perspectives and. Sure, um, I'm Monica Zent. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. Been a lawyer for just as long. I've um, founded Zent Law. It was an alternative law firm at the time when people didn't really know what alternative law firm meant. That was 15 years ago. Uh, I founded some other companies, and then also most recently, about three years ago, founded Foxworthy, which is a collaboration platform for lawyers. So here, shedding light from sort of the LSP angle as well as the legal tech angle. Uh, I'm Dan Lear. I do outreach and technology evangelism for the legal marketplace AVO. Uh, I'm a Washington licensed lawyer uh, and was a technology lawyer who practiced law uh, in technology. That was uh, like very redundant from uh, for seven or eight years before I started work at AVO about three years ago. So I will just add kind of my credibility for being on the panel. I do have a law degree. I don't practice law, but I am a licensed CPA in two countries. And um, I wrote a book for Thomson Reuters on um, key performance indicators and the whole billable hour pricing has like been the bane of my existence for the last couple of couple of years. And my day job is that I have um, a software company that can be used as technology to save lawyers all kinds of Time and money generating new business. The first topic is really kind of a almost an existential question. Um, the death of the billable hour uh, versus the recordable hour. Um, you know, there's obviously been a lot written about it. Um, recordable, obviously keeping track of your hours, but not necessarily billing your clients um, for those hours. And I think, Mary, you had something to say about, you know, how it was a trend coming up yeah. yeah you hear a lot about people talking um, lawyers talking about how it'd be great if we do flat fees and we do these alternative models but there seems to be this huge mis misconception that you wouldn't then be recording your hours and um, you know I just like to use the example if you built something if you built you know either a building or you build a car, you're going to keep track of all the pieces and all of the costs. So I know there's been some articles written and the gentleman's name always escapes me when I'm sitting up here like this, but there's been some articles written where it's saying that value, um, value pricing and value billing is something where you don't have to record your hours. And I just think that's completely incorrect. So that's, I mean, my perspective is that the legal industry struggles enough to be a business. So there shouldn't be this new way of accounting or valuing things that really just ignores all the business principles. Yeah, I mean, I can totally chime in on that. I mean, uh, I've built a firm, Zetlaw, 15 years ago that was premised on not having a billable hour model. I mean, completely got rid of it. Um, and uh, subscription plans and pricing plans and things like that that uh, <laughs> Mike doesn't like me, I guess. Um, 
you know, built on charging subscription plans and pricing plans that were completely premised on something other than billable, billable hours. However, the idea of recorded time is critical. And so the idea of people, lawyers, recording their time internally so that you know how long things take and how much time or effort something is going into a matter is really important. Um, and it was how uh, we were able to discover inefficiencies, what could be done to sort of increase uh, you know, efficiencies in certain areas, where were people spending too much effort? And so it had also helped with pricing. It helped set pricing and plans because then we could take that data internally and look at, okay, based on the recorded hours, how much time a lawyer was actually spending relative to the pricing plans. And because a lot of our offerings were on and have been on subscriptions and other types of fixed pricing models, it allowed, allowed us to price at a level that, of course, would ensure a profit margin. So again, you know, I've always approached the practice of law, first as a business person, second as a lawyer. And it's really about, I mean, the billable hour, honestly, I, the law can survive without it. It's really an issue of, um, but being able to have the data around the recorded time is really important, or remains important. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong fundamentally with the billable hour. The, the problem is that lawyers aren't particularly creative in using any other number of possible ways to sell your value. Like, there's a price point at which we, like, lawyers should all be billing out, right? If, if like, <laughs> like, that's the beauty of capitalism, right? Is like, at some point, there's a value for you to sit down and charge someone for your expertise on six minute increments. It, it, the problem is that uh, we have a hammer and everything that we see is a nail. So, like, th there's nothing inherently wrong with the billable hour. I think there's lots of ways that, that, that um, that economically it makes sense to use, but like not in every circumstance. And, right. and I think part of the problem too is that when long time ago when I was an accountant, we did we did flat fees and um, we had budgets, and so I would be like, okay, I've got the cash section, so I have ten hours to do that. So then you get to hour nine and a half, and you're wondering, what do I do now? Do I keep billing? Do I keep, and back then, it was actually a pencil and on a handwritten timesheet, but do you keep billing? And so we were told that our, comp well, there's two things, we were told that our compensation was not based on as many hours as you could bill as possible. Our compensation was based on hitting the budgets, and if we didn't put all of our hours in, then it really will screw up the pricing model and ultimately the firm will make less money because you actually are just sort of stuffing your hours somewhere else or putting it into non-billable. So that alignment between how people are rewarded and how they record their time is important. And one of the things that I've also run into is this not wanting to record non-billable time. And, which is ultimately super important in terms of if you're doing business development or if you're doing something else or CLEs or whatever, it's part of what you do in a year. So if you think that you're gonna work 1,800 or 2,100 hours and that's all gonna be billable, you're just setting yourself up for, for failure. Well, right, and, the, and really the fact that, I mean, it's the hurdle that that's the way the attorneys are being measured in the firm and that's, that's where the lack of creativity is coming from, I think. Did, I, I think we can, Take a quick yeah, question, yeah. <laughs> with shadow billing or uh, recording it, have any of you experienced or heard of people, I've, I've heard clients <coughs> say, well, I want to see what the recorded time is, and then if that's lower than the flat fee, then I want the lower time. And so that leaves lawyers in the worst of both worlds. Have you heard or experienced that? I, I know in Arizona, um, they have, you know, you have the right to ask somebody for that information. Um, <sighs> I just, I just think that's, Go that ahead. defeats the whole Go purpose, ahead. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, clients can ask for it, it's whether you give it or not. I mean, and the way it's always been set up, um, at least at Zen Law, was it, that information is not part of the transaction. I mean, the transaction is the price, the fee, the plan, or the, whatever the arrangement is, but that, that's it, the additional data that, goes into sort of how the work is performed 
isn't divulged. Um, and it's never been an issue. Um, and I, you know, ultimately, if clients are receiving value, mm -hmm. they're receiving good service, good quality work out of value, they're going to be happy. And I'm happy to say, I mean, I'm, clients have never asked for this. It's never come up because they're happy with the pricing and it becomes a win-win. So, you know, I, I would think firms could get into situations where they're they're having challenges if yeah, it's I mean, maybe overpriced. Do, do you at the restaurant, and I, like, I mean, I mean this very seriously, yeah. like, like, I mean, there's that Portlandia episode where they're like, I want to see if the chicken had a good life, right? <laughs> but that's kind of a different issue that you're trying to suss out there. Um, do you at the restaurant say, like, how much time did the cook spend on this? And, and I think, I, and I've been on this big kick lately, but, like, I think this is fundamentally a marketing and sales issue, right? It's like, you make a deal up front to provide certain value at certain cost, right? And like you shouldn't need to see how the sausage is made if you're satisfied with the value that you're receiving. And, and so I think there's like, like the, the problem is that lawyers are not very effective at selling the value that they're providing. And so therefore they're like, well, wait, I think I'm getting, I'm getting shafted. Well, like, again, like you don't care how much time Microsoft's coders spent on building Word. You just, you, you know that it works and you've, you, you've, you feel good about the value that you've received. Like we, we do these types of transactions all the time and we don't need to see what happens behind the curtain. So the, the problem is that I just don't think that we're very effectively selling and marketing the services that we provide, the value that we provide. And so therefore people are always questioning it. But I think there and are some. I mean, it, it, there, sh shadow billing is not, you know, that unusual. And, and, and it's a client service issue ultimately. You know, they want to evaluate the, the value that they're getting and you just have to be confident that you're giving them that something's going to be good when they take a look at it. I think it's also related to, to your point, Deanna, I mean, I think it, which is a great one. I think it's also related to trust mm -hmm. with clients. I mean, a lot of the practice of law is relationship oriented. It's based on trust and it's based on, and so trust obviously comes from transparency. And so being as transparent as you can about what goes into the pricing and why is the pricing set the way it's set. And that's what we've always done. That alleviates and obviates the need for a client to understand, okay, but, but tell me exactly how much time was spent on this contract. You know, it's really about the trust. It's about a level of transparency that encourages the understanding on the client's part and builds that trust. I think that also really helps. Well, I found, like, personally, we've hired people where, you know, it's a flat fee and you write the check, and to me, that's a sunk cost. It's gone. And if, if the lawyer's going to then solve my problem, I don't care. I really don't care how many hours they put in. But I know there are some states where you can actually, I think Arizona is one of them, where you can actually ask for that information, which I, I just think that's, that's it's just that's, not, just, that's backwards. It because is. Because, like, so, so basically all we're saying is that the only way that lawyers can measure value is in six-minute paid increments, right? Which is, so like, where does that leave technology? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and also, where does it leave the value of the profession? And in many ways, I mean, I think a lot of us can agree, anybody's practiced law, accounting, any other professional you know, of any kind, you can take somebody who's maybe a one-year, a novice, or you can take somebody who's a 15-year or 20-year, that one hour is going to look very different in terms of the output and the quality and the value that you get from that. So even the idea of a client sort of inquiring about, well, how much time does something take? You know, understanding who's doing the work, what's the matter, what are the facts involved, what's the experience. You know, that one hour, if it's one hour that's being spent, can be incredibly valuable. And the client's getting a bargain based on whatever the pricing scheme is because of who is actually doing the work. So there's a lot of different ways to sort of address those types of questions. Or or staffing staffing too. I mean, I think that actually leads really nicely into our next question, which is really the billable hour versus alternative fees and how it's really not a black and white issue. It's really this continuum um, of variations along, um, along a line. And clients are obviously under pressure from the business side to contain their costs. They're going to be asking for um, more information, more metrics, um, looking for different ways to compensate their outside counsel. Um, the Patrick on pricing, by the way, is where I found this really interesting continuum. I recommend taking a look at it because it's got some interesting um, <clears throat> definitions of each one of the of these types of variations. But I mean, Monica, you might be the right person to start this off, since uh, from your perspective, do you. How would you like me to start? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just about. I mean, we did rehearse this, <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no, but I mean, what, what, what would you like? I mean, to how do you feel? Do you feel like? I mean, it's. Do you have experience on, along that continuum, or do you have... Well, yeah, I mean, there are certainly 
a lot of different ways to sort of look at um, alternative billing models and what works and so forth. And uh, I mean, definitely, as I said, you know, we found that it works. Um, we've done it for many years. And it's just a matter of, uh, I would say, first of all, thinking about what kind of practice you have or what kind of, you know, it, it, it can tend to vary by the type of work that you do. Uh, also, who is your customer? What kind of audience? I mean, for years, we've always served enterprise organizations. These are large corporate law departments, major publicly traded companies. Maybe for different types of client, um, client bases, you may need to look at different types of arrangements. Uh, and then in terms of the whole compensation issue, I just want to touch on that because Mary, you raised a great point about lawyers being compensated in, in big law for how much time they bill. And obviously that's inherently stacked against the client's interests. I mean, there's, there's no way that a lawyer in, a, in big law can be compensated in a way that's going to be uh, sensible from a client's perspective. Uh, with an alternative billing arrangement, you tend not to compensate lawyers along those lines. You tend to compensate them based on hitting targets, like if you've set a plan or you've set a subscription, you know, have they met that? How many times during the year did they meet that or go over or go way under? And sort of not communicate uh, that information. And that creates an issue. And so compensation would be tied to those types of performance metrics. As well as, frankly, I mean, at Zentlaw, we've always compensated based on client service and feedback and surveys. Um, you know, really looking at the practice of law as a service industry and client satisfaction being at the top of the list. I don't know, I believe from my experience, we're pretty unique in that regard, but it's something that. I would suggest anybody that's doing some kind of alternative law firm model or going down the ALSP route, look at client feedback, client surveys, and understanding the feedback on people actually on the ground doing the work. Uh, there are a lot of different factors that go into what that feedback looks like, but that's always been a key component. Yeah, just of pushing it more towards the value end of the spectrum yeah. versus the hourly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, when I was um, with my day job, Tracklight, when we were looking for lawyers, we, we, um, we had a small firm in Arizona where, where we started, and so we did kind of like a discounted billable hour rate. And then I moved to a very large firm where we were part of their startup program, and they did, here's a monthly, and it's all you can eat. So my behavior completely changed because I'd been to law school, I would take the letters that my first attorney had created or whatever the situation, I was just like, oh, if I just tweak this, I don't have to phone her and incur the billable hours. So when I moved to the other large law firm, it just became, okay, I need this. And I, so, you know, you just have access to so many people. So that model of, you know, a flat monthly fee and you could just, it, there was no hours. Um, they don't offer that program <laughs> anymore. It's not directly tied to me, um, but they, they don't. <laughs> I'm quite sure. Yeah, the firm's yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The firm will not be mentioned. Another yeah. firm actually approached me at the same time when I was shopping around, and they had the equity model mm. where they would um, not charge any fees until the very end, um, and then it was a flat fee, and they would get you sort of from idea to you know, here, and then they would also take a piece of equity. With the other one that I chose, we paid monthly, or no, we didn't, we accrued monthly, we didn't actually have to pay anything and you didn't have to sign any personal guarantees or anything. So there's a lot of these different models. So it's kind of like the real estate market a little bit. Yeah. It's like <laughs> the, you know, at different times, it's a buyer's market or it's a seller's market. Right now, I think with a lot of these um, larger firms, when they're trying to attract early stage companies, it's, um, it's kind of, there's a lot of interesting models. And I don't know if you want to talk about the yeah, I mean, law one. Oh, the, the uh, well, no, before I do that, <laughs> yeah. no, I had a thought, I had a thought. Um, uh, well, actually, this might be a question for the audience. It's something that I'm learning more about as we go on. And um, things like, like along this continuum, there, and I'm wondering how much of it is potentially client-driven, um, where the clients are ahead um, of the firms and they're asking for these types of alternative fee arrangements. Um, things like, you know, success fees, or um, some kind of hybrid model, um, the risk collars, anything like that. Is that coming up? Um, is it coming down the road still? <laughs> I think maybe. Yeah, and I'd love to hear from the audience too, if yeah. any of you guys have seen this. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would say to your first question about our clients asking, 
you know, I would say clients have not been asking for 15 years. I mean, yeah. what I have experienced, and, and I've seen people on my team experience this, is that clients still will ask for billable hour uh, rates. They will still expect and believe that they're going to be billed by the hour, even from an alternative law firm. So it's just a matter of, uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of educating in the marketplace for a very long time, and I feel that now, finally, after 15 years, people understand what ALSPs are, we're having programs and we're talking about it, but the fact is, uh, clients are still very much in the stone ages in many, many ways. There are clients, and certainly many of the major corporate law departments are starting to sort of talk with one another, and they're, they're very open to alternative billing arrangements. And so I would say now it's a much easier sell and that they're very open to that and they're, they understand it, they know kind of it's coming, they know sort of what to expect. But this idea that clients are kind of coming forward saying, you know, please bill on a plan, you know, give me success, let's, let's talk about success fees and, and let's talk about, you know, sort of all these other arrangements, KPIs, it never comes up. It rarely ever comes up. Right, and sometimes um, when they're offered AFAs, they're like, no, just stick with that. Yeah, hourly yeah, for so now. it does yeah. take a lot of education in the marketplace, and that's what we've been doing a long time. And uh, programs like this obviously continue to educate the marketplace, but uh, eventually, I mean, in my opinion, it will be one of those things that will become very commonplace who, who alternative the, fee arrangements. Who yeah, the, did you who are the clients oh, that question. your firm? Oh, what, what uh, size of a client are you talking about? Yes, my question. Oh, um, corporate, major enterprise. Corporate because, law departments. Um, I'm with Thompson Reuters, and we're starting to see data. If you break it down, if you segment the, the corporate audiences by by revenue sizes, what you're seeing is the larger the corporation, you see economies of scale and the, and the average fees per hour that partners can charge are basically declining. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it seems to be a function of the size of the corporation. Is what we're seeing. I think it's a function of culture, frankly. I mean, I feel like it's still really a function of culture in a lot of these corporate law departments. The culture is, is still not quite as progressive as it could be, and 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 so people are still not as familiar uh, with uh, alternative fee arrangements. Or, you know, what I've often seen is, uh, and we still see this today, I mean, we've been involved with CLOCK, I know you've been involved with CLOCK, you know, so sort of legal ops is coming into its own as sort of a field. You know, there's been a lot of recognition for legal ops. And legal ops folks have been doing this work for years. Um, right. But just finally in the recent years, they've kind of begun to organize and get recognition for all of the great value that they bring to corporate law departments. And the legal ops folks have gotten this for years. I mean, this is nothing new to them. But the whole issue of um, legal ops pushing down alternative service providers and alternative service delivery models to their corporate law department teams, that's where yeah. sometimes the challenge is. That's where the rub is. is it's sometimes yeah. a cultural issue in the law departments. Yeah. Yeah, and lawyers don't want to listen to ops people. Like, that's, yeah. that's yeah, they're still happen. they're still working on gaining respect yeah. in, in the industry where people understand. I mean, yeah. but some of the big companies, Steve, to your point, some companies like Uber and Snapchat, they've engaged people, because we had a panel last year in New York, and one of the people <clears> on the panel, he goes around, and he used to work at a very large law firm, and he goes around now doing the flat fees. So something like, I think it was Snapchat and Uber both have all flat fees, including litigation. Yeah, I mean, now. they've, they've there is that law client. I mean, any, so, you know, most major clients are um, engaging on, on that basis if you can sell to them and if they're open to it. But, but it's usually gonna come from people like that from within the law department who are actually open right. to that. Yeah. If that doesn't Champions happen, then it, it takes yeah. time. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe we should turn, just in the interest of time, we have so many more topics we can talk about. Um, the, the next topic is really the, the concept of um, law firm ownership um, by non-lawyers. And um, with a few exceptions, it's pretty th still fairly theoretical in the United States, but I I believe in um, the UK and in Australia, I want to say. Um, there's been, a, at least there's a lot of discussion about it. It it's, keeps coming up, and interesting ethical questions are coming up from it, too. Um, <laughs> um, I'm looking at Sally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, nice. Oh, good. Okay, we have somebody. Um, yeah, do you want to, <laughs> you can come join the panel if you'd like. <laughs> um, so let, let's start with what would you, what would we think it would bring to the profession to have um, non-lawyers with firm ownership? So since Mary. I'm not a practicing yes. lawyer. Yes, go, go for it. <laughs> I did spend um, almost two years as director of finance in one of Canada's largest law firms. 
So it's difficult when you have all this whole big partner chip machine going and then you have like professionals i'm a professional accountant there's a professional cmo type person there's an operations person and you don't have a stake in the company you don't have a stake in the firm you're not allowed to do that and if you look at how people are motivated you're motivated by you know compensation and so it gets back to the same thing that we discussed at the beginning if you had right. that ownership i think you would incentivize some of the people in the firm. It's not necessarily the the idea of having like, you know, large pension plans or whatever invest in law firms, but more just being able to have non lawyers. Different perspective, yeah. more stronger, different business focus. Yeah. So I'm pro. Still a long way to go though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean my philosophy very much like Mary's, I mean law is a business and it can be run like a business by business people who are not necessarily the lawyers, so I totally agree with that. I think maybe where we diverge is, is on the timing. I don't feel the legal industry is probably ready for that right now. I mean, I suppose it could be, but it seems that there is probably some cultural shift that needs to happen, as well as some shift in terms of some of the infrastructure, some of the regulatory environment, some of the regulations around the practice of law. I feel like a lot of those are very much relics of the past and would hamper an ability for uh, non-legal ownership of for you know, a law firm, for example, to actually uh, be carried out in a way that makes sense. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, also even just management of conflicts, things like that. Yeah. It, it, marketing of legal services. I mean, a lot of these concepts are still you know, somewhat in the stone ages in terms of a lot of the rules of professional conduct and even issues when you get into moral character. A lot of this is, it seems like a lot of these concepts are relics of the past and if we're going to look at opening up the profession to to ownership by non-lawyers and even uh, inclusion of non sort of non-licensed professionals but who have some other kind of certification to administer right. a, a component of legal services a lot of the regulatory scheme around the law I believe needs to shift so I guess my answer is I agree with you it's I'm very much pro but maybe not pro right now <laughs> until some of the arrest well, yeah. changes. I mean, and this is something we talked about for like five seconds <laughs> before the panel, before the happy hour, I should say. Um, and it was really kind of the like the uh, the theoretical question of around ethics of you know, say KKR is a client of a firm and they also own some equity in the firm, or they they have firm ownership in some way. Like, how do you resolve those kinds of conflicts? It goes so deep. And um, so law is seen, seen as so I, an outlier. We, one thing that I think that we heavily, again, talk, going back to the billable hour discussion, one thing, and we didn't talk about this before, but it, like it's so blatantly obvious, like there exists some pretty inherent conflicts of interest in the current legal business model as well, right? Where it's like, right. I'm incentivized to string out your legal matter to as long as I can, because then you will pay me more, mm -hmm. right? So like, we right. already have like some some economic interests that are directly in opposition yeah. to and and we expect lawyers and hopefully they do to navigate that landscape pretty effectively or we we, right. we expect them to not not navigate it pretty we expect them to navigate it effectively whether or not they do so what's that oh so so <laughs> I was just gonna say well you guys have been talking like, <laughs> Go on, saying, please finish you know, your thought. Come on, like uh, the diversity candidate here, I'm feeling <laughs> refreshed. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, I think that uh, like to to I mean, it's kind of like I was I was talking with a lawyer in Texas who was saying like, I guess in Texas they have to have all of their advertising approved by a separate advertising committee, right? And yet lawyers are the ones telling advertising executives whether or not their advertising is legal. And they're not in a position to make a decision about the legality of their own advertising. Like, so, so like similarly, yeah. when lawyers are advising other people right. on conflicts of interest, when they are on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with conflicting uh, interests and conflicting sort of power dynamics in organizations and in, right. and in legal systems, to think that that's not another piece that they could deal with and sort of hold in... Um, Right. In, in, in tandem seems kind of ridiculous. What's more, again, going back, like we already have conflicts that, that harm the clients to a large degree. So like figuring out how to solve those, if, if, if bringing in outside investors is one way to do that, I think we should at least be open to it. Yeah. 
Yeah, Santa Monica. I'll go with you, Sally. I have to chime in here. Obviously, I'm slightly biased because Legal Zoom has an ABS license and we do own and will work. But I think that the idea of using incentive for an equity partner or a law firm to be forward thinking. I think what's best, not only for their yep. clients, but also for the firm moving forward, because it, guess what? Most of them are aging out because of the market. It's just the way it is. And they are just looking to cash out. Can't blame them, but that's the way it is. And there is zero incentive for them to invest in technology, to invest in new process, to invest in new systems. And as a result, all we're seeing is all these mergers at the top of the, <laughs> the big firms are all getting together because they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the divide between the large firm and the small firm is getting bigger. The other factor of it, is, to Dan's point, is spot on. I think it's insulting, and I'm going to say this as a lawyer, I think it's insulting to say that we can't draw the line between what's ethical and what's not. Me, I work at a corporation. Does that mean I'm not ethical as a lawyer? That would, yeah, it's insulting to me. Right, and you're not yeah. a lawyer at the corporation. I mean, no, you are a lawyer, not. but you're not the corporation's I mean, lawyer. Yeah. yeah, and you, you, you make I'm, those decisions and feel like you can be an ethical person. Absolutely, yeah. but I work with a network of lawyers. Every single day, I'm that intermediary where I push back against my company saying, no, I'm not okay with this because this is putting them in a compromising position and we're not going to do it. And because they cannot do this because they, they took an oath. And I know it seems trivial, but I felt more pressure as an associate at a large law firm to bill whether or not I had actually done the hours than I do in a corporation. Now, talk about talk advice. about shady billing, not shadow <laughs> billing. <laughs> Did you, I was gonna yeah. Yeah. The jokes are free. Yeah. Yeah. No, the jokes are free. Nice. Personal opinion, let me caveat with that. But I think the lawyers out there, yes, there are a few of us that, you know, promote the bad reputation that we have, but I would say in large the lawyers that I work with, that I'm fortunate to work with, are exemplary and they are they would never do anything that would <clears throat> impugn the oath that they took to be a good lawyer. And it's very different from the business world. There is no MBA ethical oath, oath <laughs> that they have to take, let's face it. Sorry, yeah, I want to take yeah. I, I was as I was listening to you, it struck me that um, I think we need to draw a distinction between letting non lawyers become partners which, as far as I can tell, makes no difference whatsoever. Um, you can have non-lawyer partners in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, many lobbying right. firms are structured that way. Right. You have been able to have non-lawyer partners in Canada for years, and it hasn't made a difference in any way for clients in the way that law firms are structured and run. And I think we need to draw a distinction between non-lawyer partners and access to capital, mm -hmm. which is a totally different yeah. type of thing. And so when we talk about non-lawyer ownership, the one seems totally uncontroversial to me, and I don't even know why we talk about it, because, but we have to because the ABA won't do it. But <laughs> right, we love it together. Non-lawyer partners, non partners is so uncontroversial, I, I, I don't even know why we are arguing about it. Um, but the, cap, the access to capital is a bigger and different issue that actually has the potential to be transformative. I don't think non-lawyer partners has the potential to be transformative, but access to capital totally does. And I think that's when you see the huge differences, like in Europe and Australia, it's yeah. access to capital that made the big difference, not non-lawyer partners. And what's interesting is American capital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you That's change your mind? Did you want to add something? No, my mind is basically the same point. Oh, yeah. I think the, bigger, the biggest reason for doing this is, is because we all see that technology is going to become more and more important to law firms, and, right. and you need access to capital to do that, and the current models of the support. Right. Us. Right. Yeah, and I think that's what's creating the big, huge firms growing together because they have enough money with all of these partners. And then you have the small firms where all of us who sell technology, it's easy to go to a small firm. They want to load up on the technology because they can see that they can leverage. It's those mid-sized firms that are just going to disappear because they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. Just to follow up on, on these thoughts. Um, 
it seems to me sensible that the sort of current ethical framework, the regulatory framework as it stands today would work if you just had non-partnered lawyers. Fine. But then you start to think about the access to capital and big investors coming into a law firm. And my question is, are you know sort of standard fiduciary duties as they are today enough to manage that problem? Or do you have to start thinking in a really creative new way about managing admittedly existing conflicts that are there today, sure, but this is a different set. Does that require a different organization? What 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 would that require? So I want to I want to say two things because one thing that came up when we were talking earlier, that Monica brought it up, and I think it's actually a really interesting question. Um, I know LegalZoom thinks about this, we think about this, and I I think it's it's worth at least acknowledging is that the current regulatory structure for the legal sector in this country is so um, kind of distributed, right, 50 state model, that it makes it really challenging to scale anything. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I personally believe that as we see, um, as we see uh, borders becoming, international borders becoming incre increasingly less relevant, um, state borders, <laughs> right, like are, are even less so. Um, and so, like, I think one of the overarching things that we talked about earlier that I think is sort of a relevant piece of this is, like, really rethinking the way that we regulate law um, or lawyers or legal services in, in the country. Um, and there are lots of actually really interesting and important reasons why regulating on a, and I would even argue from an innovation perspective, regulating on a local level is really important. Um, I mean, one, one of the things that we, I think, you know, sort of one innovation theory about the country is that, like, people can try interesting, innovative legal things in one state um, and, it, you know, can serve kind of as a laboratory. So I actually think local, local legal, we don't want local legal sort of regulation to go away. But on the other hand, like, it, it's, a real, it's a real barrier and, and it's in, an increasingly irrelevant barrier. Um, one other, I think the other piece, though, more to your question, um, and love to hear Sally speak to this as well. Like this is happening in the UK. What what the UK is doing is that they're regulating on an entity basis as opposed to a per lawyer basis, um, and all of the duties accrue to the entity. And you know, keep me honest here, uh, as opposed to the individual lawyer, um, and it's working fine. And in fact, I'd argue that. Um, now, granted, they're a very different country with, with a very different, well, similar and different legal history, certainly different geography. Um, but they, um, like, it's, 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 work, it's working just fine. Well, that's what I was going to say. So, like, there's a way that this entity regulation actually may even begin to sort of address that bifurcated, that very distributed nature of, of local regulation. But no, like, it's happening and it's, it's, it seems to be working just fine. It's like the theme for tonight. That's David's it's hashtag. It's, it's happening. happening. It's happening. <laughs> well, and the, it's interesting that you, you know, going back to your innovation comment, I think that's a really good um, segue to what we were going to also mention, um, which is, you know, the states, states trying different things and things like the in Washington, the limited legal. Yeah, the triple LT. The, yeah, the, technician. Again, <laughs> yeah. Association's <laughs> terrible branding. Uh, the, the triple LT, the limited license legal technician. Yes. That's one of. So of the yeah, two can states, you describe it yeah, a little? And, one of yeah. the two states or places in which you can have people who are not lawyers owning a part of a law firm um, and even sharing in the profits of the law firm, again, no, no access to capital, are Washington, D.C. and Washington State. Um, but it's very limited. That's right. Yeah, the, rule, the rules are different. The regulations to become a triple LT are harder than becoming a lawyer. <laughs> so we haven't, we haven't got to, I, there, I don't know that there, that's not that's not 100. So that's not 100. I mean, we can we can debate. It's not 100 percent true. I mean, I've met a few of those folks, and it, I mean, harder. I'm not sure. They, yeah, they have to they have to have practiced or been involved in legal services for a period of time. They have to then take some schooling. They have to take like a mini bar, um, not the hotel kind. Um, and and so, uh, but there's a whole discussion. There's there's a whole discussion around whether that's the right thing. Well, and is that and an we alternative were about delivery? This earlier. Yeah. I think the one thing you have to say, and I say this all the time, and I know the folks well in Washington. That's where I live, who have put this program into place. Um, uh, kudos for trying something. Like, thank you for doing something. Right. It may not be the right thing, but like, thank you for for actually opening the door at least a little bit. Um, 
So, and like, so you asked me the question though, before we got spun off and that is what are they? Let me just quickly say, so it's, it's basically a, um, it's an individual who does not complete law school, who, ha who passes a series of qualifications and can deliver legal services entirely independently. So they can set up a, their, you may know in like, so, as opposed of, to a paralegal, right? Yeah. yeah a licensed paralegal in some ways, or I, you know, like notaries outside of this country, physician, PA, like right. Um, and so, so that's what they are. And there are specific rules about how they're licensed, but also how they can either set up their own shop and deliver legal services independently or share um, fees with a lawyer. And that it's, it's, I also live in Washington. And so it's <laughs> limited to um, oh, family, law. family law exclusively. And yeah. they're going to, they're actually looking to expand it to another practice area next, I think immigration or maybe trust states. Yeah, it, depends law, which, it depends on elder law. It depends on which, uh, which group of people you talk to. <laughs> we, no, 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 I was going to say it depends on which arm of the bar can muster the most political will to stop them and be like, no, you should go after that sector. Um, but, Sally, to your point, I talked to a couple, like we had an evolved law, yeah, law event. Yeah. It was, a while ago, I think it was just last month. Two or three month. weeks. Yeah. yeah, and there were a whole bunch of folks there, and they feel badly because they're able to take this chunk of the market, but that was exactly what this woman, she's like, yeah, we don't have to go to as much school. I feel kind of bad, and I was like, <laughs> no, you should feel great because there's 80% of people that live in Washington can't access family law. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, kudos I, for trying. Yeah, I mean, that's I, our motto. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting <laughs> to try different different types of arrangements. I mean, I'm a technologist, so I have to say that technology, in my opinion, really is going to unlock a lot of savings and scalability in law, not necessarily new licensed or unlicensed versions of lawyers. But in any event, I mean, the idea of trying it is a good idea. And, and I, I will say that probably it could help unlock a lot of the challenge with access to justice. I mean, there is a contingent of the population that needs access to justice that simply can't afford a lawyer. And so similar to the medical profession where you've got, you know, you had you have maybe PhDs in a certain field, now you've got master's degrees doling out, maybe mental health, you know, they're a little cheaper, and you know, or you have different types of physician's assistants, another great example. So you have people that can administer some degree of legal assistance at a lower cost. You know, if that increases access to justice, I mean, by all means, we should be trying to get those options. Yeah. But, but I still believe technology is going to be able to and be a tool. Yeah. And I mean, technology is the change agent in yeah. the legal business model is going to be basically the closing theme, I think, since it's been running through all of our conversations. Um, I mean, it could be a really great panel on its own, I think. Um, but, you know, with the obviously with the rise of legal ops teams and they're, they're like we were, I was saying before, a lot of times they're ahead of the firms and they're asking about it. They're, you know, they're making requests on RFPs on how innovation is, you know, examples for innovation and efficiencies through technology. Um, I think we're kind of running out of time actually. So maybe we can wrap it up with, you know, like a takeaway. How can we bring in more uh, technology into the law as a change agent? 30 seconds each. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we set timer? Um, no. <laughs> So one of the things that, I, uh, two things. First, it doesn't have to be legal technology. It can be technology for the law. Right. And second, we can't ignore the change aspect to it because I've seen tons of implementations where people are looking at it, they buy it, they implement it, and they don't change the way they do fill in the blank, whatever it is in their practice, one bit. So they're not going to use the technology, and we're not going to solve the access to justice problem. You need, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, you, know, you need the champions okay. yeah. within yeah. Um, the firm. Yeah. I'm going to be a bit of the contrarian. I actually, like, I love me some technology. Technology is great. <laughs> but, like, what we actually need to do is we need to figure out how to solve client problems in a seamless way. They don't care what's happening behind the curtain. Um, they just want their problem solved. And I, I fundamentally think that technology has to play a, a crucial role in that. But I actually don't think that most consumers, we've, we've we discussed this more for another panel, we'll discuss it another time. Like a lot of consumers, be they corporate or individuals, I actually don't think that they care that much about whether or not you're using technology. What they want to know is whether their problem is solved. Now, if you want to scale a meaningful business, you're going to have to use technology today. That's, that's it's sort of like a, a requirement. It's almost like an arms race. But I, I'm not, I, I don't think we should adopt technology for technology's sake. We should adopt a technology to solve client problems. And hopefully that is completely seamless and invisible to the client. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, technology alone isn't a panacea. It's really about culture, and it's also about the right technology. Um, you know, poor technology adopted by the best of cultures is not going to give you the result you want, and great technology adopted by the worst of cultures is not going to get you the result you want. So it has to be a combination of culture and technology. Culture in the law firm or culture in the legal environment, culture in the law department to adopt technology to not be afraid of technology and to leverage technology to scale and be more efficient. That's going to be the key. And then, of course, having great technology. As a legal technologist, it's really about creating the best product we can, solving a real problem that exists, going after something that you know will help a lawyer deliver greater value, whether it's by saving time, getting them access to information they need, you know, helping them run data or metrics on cases or you know, case law, whatever the, the problem is we're trying to solve as legal technologists, it's about helping lawyers solve that problem so ultimately they can be the best possible professionals and deliver great service. Yeah, and I mean, we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, that's reflected in, you know, what we've been seeing when, we, when we've been receiving pitches at Next Law Labs and, and the trends that we're seeing throughout that. I mean, it's reflected in, you know, where are the pain points? How are we, you know, people, there's, a, there's a desire for more metrics. There's people tackling, you know, the like higher and esquires dealing with the um, on-demand legal economy. Um, you got, you know, requests for dealing, doing things a lot faster, better, cheaper with artificial intelligence, like, you know, Ross and Beagle and, and ultimately, bringing it all together is really, the, it's got to be the mix, I think, of the culture of innovation as well as um, champions within the firm, which is what we, yeah. Does anyone want to um, weigh in on that? We just have a few more minutes. Yes, please. <laughs> or don't weigh in like that. <laughs> yeah. Or we can close. It's all good then. Thank you. Stafford's cup. Stafford is up next. Yeah. <laughs> no. okay. Can I sit down now, Mary? <laughs> yes, you may sit down now. Okay, Stafford didn't give me a bio, so I could just make one up, or perhaps instead I will let Stafford come up and he introduce himself. And. So we're going to end with a Darwin talk, and then there'll be a little bit more networking where we can argue about some things out there that we were talking about. So, um, <laughs> so Stafford is going to do his Darwin talk, which is called Eli Whitney and the Artificial Lawyer. So there you go. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's been a long uh, hour, I'm sure, of a lot of interesting discussion. Um, I'm calling this talk Eli Whitney and the Artificial Lawyer. That's Eli Whitney. And he was the most important person in the 1800s in the United States for two reasons that are relevant to the discussion you've been having, actually. The first is that Eli Whitney invented this, the cotton gin or engine, which solved the age-old problem of separating cotton fibers from seeds. Well, this resulted in the massive planting of cotton in the American South and made industrial slavery profitable for the first time. Um, some people argue that it extended slavery in the United States by decades. That's the first thing Eli Whitney did. The second thing Eli Whitney did, and it's how he made his money in the grand tradition of Silicon Valley, Eli Whitney got a contract from the government to produce muskets. In order to do that, he instituted one of the first practical applications of using interchangeable parts and in products in order to engage in large-scale manufacturing. So if you want to know who the first 1% was in the United States during this time period, they were gun owners. Guns uh, were made by hand by gunsmiths. Um, they were not interchangeable. Almost no one owned a gun. And uh, if they broke, it was almost impossible to get them fixed. But the use of interchangeable parts by Whitney and some persons following Whitney, like Samuel Colt, changed everything. There were 20 times more guns in the United States in a few decades. They cost one-tenth the cost. And it's possible to argue that Eli Whitney not only caused the Civil War, but enabled it. That's Eli Whitney. Now, we're in a similar situation today with the industrialization of the law. 
most lawyers, in some sense, hand build at least some of their work. But that's rapidly changing, at least for routine work, as some of the speakers have discussed. There'll be more change in the legal profession in the next 20 years than there has been in the last 200. And you can see this in a number of different ways. For instance, first figure, interchangeable parts, 25 to 5. Um, until recently, large corporations routinely had 25, 30 different law firms that they work with uh, for different legal work. But since 2008, that has changed radically. Most of these relationships have now shifted into global panels of between five and six law firms that handle globally all the work for those companies worldwide. All the other law firms, shut out. Second ratio, whoops, sorry about that. Second ratio is 100 to 13. That's the number of global 100 firms that are above 2,000 lawyers. And large corporate clients care. They're commonly insisting to be part of the global panel that law firms be everywhere they are. But there aren't enough large law firms to really handle that type of demand. And the confluence of these factors are going to mean that firms will need to grow rapidly and globally to meet these challenges. But the question that's being asked today in the seminar is, OK, but to do what? Right? To do what? So this is the age, or soon will be the age, of what people refer to as the artificially intelligent lawyer. Or maybe just the intelligent lawyer, depending on your position on lawyers. I'm not here to debate that. Um, but as discussed by the speakers, it's true that the use of machine learning technologies, coupled with big data analytics, are definitely automating and will automate some significant amount of work that lawyers normally do, including legal research, the drafting of briefs synchronized from reading a million cases, assistance in drafting contracts against standards that are evolved using data analytics as well, uh, intelligent document review that we already have. This is the industrialization of law by using technology based on interchangeable parts. And in that, we're in the same type of situation or an inflection point that Whitney was in his day. That's one way to look at it. It's how I see it. But the key point here, when we talk about the artificial lawyer, is that not everything was mechanized in the 1800s, and not everything is being mechanized today. Um, the current stage of artificial intelligence is a little bit of a misnomer. What you're dealing with is something referred to technically as applied artificial intelligence or narrow artificial intelligence or weak artificial intelligence, which is the ability to do some human things. But what we don't have and probably won't have for some very long indeterminate time is general artificial intelligence, where machines can do all things humans can do. Um, the ability to do this is in the distant future. One author says it's the difference between the current state of, of um, space flight right now in being able to fly in space faster than the speed of light to reach stars far away from the Earth. So what does that have to do with pi? Not pi, but pi. Right? Um, well, lots of times when you're dealing with a problem in the law, one party wants to slice the pi. The other wants to blow it up or throw it away, or sell it to somebody else for a higher price, and you don't get any. What lawyers do that machines don't do and will not be able to do, at least for the very foreseeable future, is two things of great importance to clients, and I think to society. While lawyers are required to give objective advice to clients, they base that objective advice on subjectivity. It's the understanding of the subjective nature of a situation that a transaction or a case inhabits that causes decisions to be made by clients. 
Lawyers exercise wisdom when they have the ability to feel and to sense in themselves and others subjective motivation and perceptions. These are the things that drive human behavior in human transactions. Now, much of human behavior is simply not logical. We see it in law practice all the time. The fear of losing, revenge, ideology, memory, concerns about the effect on a long-term transaction of multiple deals. Game theorists are still trying to work out how to make that into an algorithm. And other strategic considerations that are built largely on human instinct and human desire. A lawyer or a law firm worth its fee has to be an expert in these subjective matters. And data, and big data, will give you predictive outcomes. That's true. But choice and how to act and how not to act will always be made based on context and motive. As a friend of mine says, context, um, excuse me, contents are king, but context is God. So where does that leave us? That's the first thing that lawyers do. The second thing that lawyers do is advocate. What they really do when we work is to advocate based on asyn asynchronous and illogical situation between two parties. Asynchronous and illogical. And what we do is once we perceive an appropriate position, we first advocate to our client that it's in their best interest to adopt a course of conduct or decision making. And then we turn around and advocate to the other side in a lawsuit, in a transaction, to persuade the other side to accept our view of the problem and our solution, to believe that our part of the problem, our solution, is in their best interest. That's how you reach agreement, it's how you persuade, it's how you reach the end. So, author, and that's how cases are won and that's how deals get done. So ultimately, lawyers is properly understood in this context, in context being God, are persons who willingly insert themselves into positions of conflict in human transactions to advance the cause of another human or a human institution. And it's necessary in order to do that effectively to understand the true nature of human thought, human action, human reaction if done correctly. And I simply submit to you that within at least our lifetimes, a machine will never be able to do that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for coming this evening, and I think there's still a little bit more wine and cheese out there, so everyone go enjoy themselves, and we'll see you at the next, well, we'll see a lot of you tomorrow at Future Law, so. <laughs>